Greetings, and I'm glad to be back um, with my friend, ba Barry Silver's congregation. And this presentation from the mind of Leonardo da Vinci is about his visionary machines and ideas, not his paintings. There were only 13 paintings that have been firmly ascribed to him, and yet that is what most of us think of when we think of Leonardo da Vinci. My hope is after this, that will change. Born in 1452, Leonardo lived through the time of Columbus and the time of his arch rival, Michelangelo. Imagine that. In this presentation, we are focusing only on his inventions, his ideas, and his engineering concepts, which sometimes exceeded the technology of his day to actually produce the designs that he envisioned. Because Leonardo lacked the formal education in mathematics and Latin, he did not attend a university and did not attend the university. His scientific studies were largely ignored by contemporary scholars. If his ideas had not been ignored, it has been said that our current technology would be at least a century ahead. Leonardo was the illegitimate son of a wealthy Florentine notary and a peasant woman, Caterina. He was raised by that mother until he was five years old. His father's new wife, a 16 year old girl, had developed a very close relationship with, with him, but she died young. Leonardo was said to have been beautiful when young. He was educated in the studio of Andr Andrea del Verrocchio. Leonardo outperformed Verrocchio so much that that uh, Verrocchio uh, decided not to paint anymore. Leonardo was accused of sodomy and stood trial. And because he was involved with three men, some of who were Medici's, he was exonerated, but he never dis discussed sex again in his life. He was a vegetarian. He was an arch enemy of Michelangelo. He died at the age of 67 in France from a stroke. Leonardo was the ultimate Renaissance man. So he was involved in painting, sculpting, cartography, which is map making, chemistry, civil engineering, geology, hydrodynamics, optics, mechanical engineering, physics, zoology, astronomy, geometry, pyrotechnics, military engineering, musicology, medical illustration, and anatomy, physiology, philosophy. And he also was involved with urban planning in terms of, in, in terms of um, designing what he considered to be an ideal city. Leonardo kept logs about everything and they have, they're called codices. So here are the topics, mechanics and geometry, construction of fortifications, essays on the science of painting, <clears throat> flight, musical instruments, mathematics, botany, weaponry, geometry, mechanics of bird flight, astronomy, properties of water, rocks, air and light. This particular codex was purchased by Bill Gates for $33 million and he's displaying it around the world. Literature, military and religious architecture. These are the, the Codex Forster. They're located in London in the Victoria and Albert Museum. The topics include hydraulics, geometry, sketches, crossbow design, clothing design, and theory of weights. Before we get on to the transfer of power, I want to just give a, 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 a caveat. <clears throat> there are some concepts that have implications here, and I'll tell you why in a few moments. One is called simultaneous invention. That is the hypothesis that most scientific discoveries and inventions are made independently and more or less simultaneously by multiple scientists and inventors in more than one location. So you can have the same 
invention in China as you can in Italy. And so it becomes difficult to say who was the one who thought of it. Then there's another concept called cultural diffusion. And that is an idea travels to another country, another land, but without the details as how to construct it and or implement the idea. So the receiving culture learns of the idea, but must independently create the invention. And that's why you can have two cultures claiming the, uh, um, the origin of the same ideas or inventions. And the reason why this is important is because when you see the transfer of power, one of the things you're going to see are inventions that were also in China prior to Leonardo. So the question is, is this an independent invention of Leonardo? Did he hear about it through the silk trade? Or did he, or did he learn this from um, exposure to Chinese uh, thinkers? So take a look at this. This is called an exploded view. This wheel, double wheel and this rod over here are shown exploded, uh, that's expanded. And Leonardo was the first one to do that. The power source of this is a rope on this peg tied to a, a rock. And as gravity pulls it down, it spins this, turns this device over here, which then turns it the, the, um, the, the vertical wheels. So it's a horizontal power being transferred into a horizontal power. Gears like this already existed in Chinese technology. It is possible that Leonardo learned of this technology through Italy's trade with China, or that he came upon the idea himself. So the power from this wheel is transferred to this wheel through these gears. This is vertical power being translated to horizontal power. So as the spindle turns, it then causes this wheel to turn. And so you can move power around. This is called the worm gear, the thing on top. And what Leonardo noticed was when you had the, just the gear, gears with the pegs and you stopped it, it would go backwards for a few minutes. So the worm screw, he devised this mechanism to prevent the vertical gear from going the wrong direction when the mechanism is stopped. This is a ratchet design. So this wheel cannot go backwards. It can only go one direction. This bar keeps it from, from going backwards and we have currently ratchet wrenches that work in the same principle. Look at these chains. These chains look very familiar. Um, because these are the same kinds of chains we have on bicycles today. Chains are another way power is transferred. In a bicycle, the power generated by pedaling is transferred by the link chain to the rear wheel. Again, the Chinese had a form of chains, so it's hard to know if Leonardo arrived at this idea independently or through cultural diffusion. And here's another chain gear, very similar to what was in China. And the power is being translated, transferred from one wheel to another by the chain link. Leonardo's flying machines. He said, once you have tasted flight, you will walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward for there you have been and there you will long to return. Leonardo was fascinated with avian flight and sought to replicate their feet using human anatomy. He was an astute observer of birds and dedicated an entire codex to the flight of birds. This is a glider that he constructed. This flying machine was actually constructed in 2002 and successfully tested with man flight five times. The longest flight was for 18 seconds and the man ate plenty of dirt in the trials. But hey, it was designed 500 years ago. The frame was constructed of bamboo as per her, his design specifications. The material used in the test was contemporary sail material. Leonardo specified the use of cotton resin. Leonardo included mechanisms and directions for control of the device, but there is suspicion that he 
even included misinformation to foil those less talented from creating a working model and gaining wealth and fame, which was his to have claimed. And you'll hear a little more about that. The fact that Leonardo built in to some of his designs a failure. The aerial screw. Part of the effort he, what here was for, Le, for Leonardo, a continuation of his studies of the potential of the spiral screw shape. Using the idea of a screw design, Leonardo envisioned a device made of linen in which the pores were stopped up with starch. He thought that the turning of this mechanism would cause the device to rise high. It was never built and therefore never tested. Considering the power to be delivered by four men turning the cranks, the weight would have made flight impossible. But Leonardo never constructed it, so he didn't know. <clears throat> Using the concept of linen with stopped pores, Leonardo decided a, de designed a pyramidal parachute 200 years before the credited inventor of the contemporary uh, parachute did in 1783. In the year 2000, a daredevil constructed Leonardo's parachute and actually field tested the device. It worked as intended. However, the modern parachute design is predicated upon the parasol, while that of Leonardo's is predicated upon a tent. And the man who tried it in, in uh, the year 2000 was an expert parachutist, and he said Leonardo's parachute was easier to control than the ones that he had learned on and, and operated. The ornithopter. This was a machine which recreates the movements of birds. It was a four magnifier, but not sufficient lift was produced. It's a prototype of the modern aircraft design, but the wings flapping provided propulsion, not lift. <clears throat> he was the first to conceptualize the concept of lift. Leonardo concluded a flying machine could have fixed wings if there was a separate mode of propulsion. Leonardo studied drag and the role of streamlining in the reduction of drag. Leonardo's military machines. While Leonardo abhorred war, he recognized that the monetary advantage he could gain through the creation of war machines, map making, military engineering, and the improvement of existing military equipment and defense designs. Some of his innovations were centuries ahead of the time, and had they been constructed, might have proved to be a game changer for the owner of the devices that he designed. For example, the tank. Designed for failure, the tank had all the capabilities of modern tanks except forward motion. Reinforced slanted sides covered with metal plates protected the eight men inside who provided the power through a system of cranks. Cannons were ranged in and around on the circumference of a circular design with deliberate ordnance into massed infantry. So where was the design fault which made this machine incapable of forward motion? When all the cranks turned, the gears which powered the wheels countered each other, so no motion was possible. Since Leonardo was detail-oriented, this was probably not a design flaw, but a purposeful impediment to the successful construction of this war machine. Two motivations have been advanced for such designed failure. One was that Leonardo was a pacifist and never wanted the machine to work. But that raises the question as to why then did he design the machine in the first place? The second rationale is more likely. By making detailed drawings for such a machine, but with a major design flaw, he protected others from creating the tanks without his permission and advantage in creating the device. And here's his drawing of the machine. This is an exploded view of the tank. Counting the notion that Leonardo was a pacifist is the drawing of devices for severing the legs at the knees of massed infantry. The forward motion of several of device would create the energy needed to turn arms with the metal blades. Let me just cut something out of a line here. 
So this is a photo of the inside of the tank. And you can see the cannons all around it. And these are the cranks that, that provide, would provide the motion if it wasn't had, didn't have a design for it. So countering the notion that Leonardo was a pacifist is the drawing of devices for severing the legs at the knees of massed infantry. The forward motion of several of his devices would create the energy needed to turn arms to which metal blades were attached. This fan-like motion, when brought into force into mass troops would probably have been, had the effect that he depicted in his drawing. And if you look at the drawing, you'll see people with severed legs. However, the operator of such a device would have been the target of the enemy, making retirement planning unnecessary for that operator. And here is a model of a smaller device that Nino designed, and this was displayed in um, Denver. These mortars are amazingly similar to that of mortars of the Civil War, and they were designed to hurl large stones of small caliber or small caliber iron balls, which are fired at the enemy like grape shots. The mortars can also fire exploding shells loaded with metal shrapnel, which could devastate the mass lines of the infantry. And there's a picture of it. So they would shoot either a large ball like this and then it would explode and you have little ones like this and then it would scatter shrapnel all over the place. And you would just clear a line of mass troops coming at you. Leonardo designed a multi-barrel field piece. He realized that the weight of the cannons of his time proposed a problem in terms of mobility and reloading time. His solution was a multi-barrel gun, fast and light and easily loaded. The design featured three thin cannons in, in front loaded and adjustable. Pre-loaded, these would give significantly more firepower per battery than conventional designs. The lighter weight allowed for the mobility on the battlefield. Leonardo's preference for gunpowder was also an advanced thinking of his time. While he still designed crossbows and variations on the theme, he was aware that future of war was explosive powder. And here are more devices. This is a kind of a machine gun. Of course, it doesn't have a machine, so it's not really a machine gun. And what you had was a, a, a 11 cannon slide. So you would, you would load these up and you crank it and another, uh, uh, this would then turn down and cool and you were loading another one while you're shooting it. So it was a continuous um, line of fire. This is the 33 barrel organ ca uh, cannon because it resembled pipes on an organ. It was three rows of 11 cannons each while one row fired simultaneously, the others were either cooling or being loaded and providing continuous fire. Leonardo was involved in designing forts, the defenses and design. So this device here is a device that would knock over scaling ladders. And what would happen is you would have either people pulling or cranks or oxen pulling and would put, push these forward and knock over the ladders. And here is a model of what that would have looked like. In this case, there's a crank over here and it would knock the ladders over from a fort. Lira designed low profile walls for this fort and the slanting walls were designed to deal with cannon fire. So <clears throat> he designed this for Milan around 1508. It was probably designed for the French who conquered Milan and needed to hold their conquest. It provided minimum surface area for artillery fire. Probably it was designed for a mountaintop placement. The walls can absorb cannon fire and there's no traditional battlements. These are very closely related to what the Nazis constructed in their fort designs. Leonardo's maritime machines. This is a semi 
submersible submarine. It isn't really a submarine because it would be this would be above the water. This is a flotation device. And the idea was to get close to a boat so you can destroy the boat, bring explosive devices to the boat. This is Leonardo's design of a battleship. So this is very similar to the tank design with the cannons all around it. And here you have a picture on the right hand side of people pushing the gears to make this thing go. This is a double hull, a double hull for um, ship construction. Now the Chinese had this way before Leonardo did. So who designed it? I don't know. The idea is that if the outer shell of the of the hull was compromised, you it would fill with water, but the inner shell would still allow the boat to float. The paddle boat offers many advantages over the sail and even the oar. A paddle boat can stop, turn on a dime, and even go in reverse. It, it is independent of the prevailing wind and not immobilized by still air. The paddle boat was operated by foot treadles. The gears transferred the power from the vertical to horizontal and back to the vertical. And there's a model constructed according to his design. Walking on water, yep. This is pontoons and pontoon um, post over there. So you can float on top of, walk on top of water. This is a life-saving device, like a life raft when you throw overboard. Diving apparatus, designed for sneak attacks on enemy ships. The leather, leather diving suit, um, it's a leather diving suit and there's a cane breathing tube, a cork diving bell. The mask operated a balloon for ascending and descending, and there was even a pouch for urination. And over here, he had a stent inside of his breathing tube so that it wouldn't collapse from water pressure. And again, it was constructed and it worked just as designed. And here's how it works. The cork would float and the air would come in there and go down the tube, supported by a stent, and the person could stay in the water and walk up close to a ship. Mechanical engineering for practical use. The viola organista plans. It's an experimental musical instrument. It's the first known bowed keyboard instrument. Leonardo designed many versions of this instrument and they appear in his notebooks of 1488 and 1489. And what it is, it looks like a, a piano, except the piano works by percussion, a hammer hitting the strings. This one works similar to violin by having a, a, a bow crossing over the strings. His notes and drawings were for this were in the Codus Atlanticus. Wheels continuously rotating, pulling loops, looping bows perpendicular to the instrument strings. A single rotating wheel, similar to that of the hurdy-gurdy to play the strings. It differs from the hurdy-gurdy and is that a small number of strings that are constantly in contact with the wheel. The keyboard had a lowering mechanism which allowed individual notes to be played alone. Uh-oh. I lost. I lost the presentation. No, that's just the YouTube video. Okay, but can you, uh, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just go to the next slide. It's not advancing. Let's see if this will advance it. Okay. Oh, you're smart.
It is not known if Leonard actually built one, but the first documented model was built in 1575. Other models were constructed, but the most true to Leonardo's design is shown with his inventor in Poland. It was constructed in 2013. And the video that it would not display was that musical instrument being played. I'll have to delete that slide. This is the mechanical programmable drums for a parade. And by pulling out the pegs, you can change the way that the um, the hammers would hit the drum. This is a roasting device using the power of convection. So you have a fire on the bottom and the fire on the bottom, the fire on the bottom tur uh, turns the spindle over here and then the power goes down to the spindle and it turns vertical and right over here. And now what you're doing is turning your chicken or meat over here and spinning just by the power of the, the fire turning it. The pound lock was invented by the Chinese and allowed a canal to um, go up and down hill so you can lock up section, fill it with water, deplete it with water. But Leonardo realized that when you had a solid board across the flow of water, it leaked a lot of water. The miter box got tighter than the pressure of the water, making a better seal. This design was incorporated in the original Panama Canal. And here's his drawing. This is a pole erector. The pole erector is actually a simple concept. Lay the pole out with one end set in the carriage with wheels crank in the carriage, and the pole will also move. If the other end of the pole is elevated, the pole will rise to a vertical position. All it takes is a little math to determine where to position the pieces, and one is able, with little assistance, to place a pole vertically in a pre-dug hole. No cranes are needed. This is the file making machine employing the force of gravity. The use of mechanical advantage and the force of gravity work to create metal files automatically and without human decision making. A crank shown in the foreground winds a rope around the shaft. This raises the weight. Releasing the weight moves, moves it to the ground, turning a wheel which through transfer power operates the stamp while moving the file in position for the next groove. This is the cam device, which we now use in, it's in all of our cars. And here's the cam device. When you crank this, the cam lifts and put, puts the hammer down so you can do an automatic pounding of a piece of metal repeatedly without having to use your own arms to do it. The cam would do it. Believe it or not, Leonardo was involved in bridge design. This is called the supportless bridge. There are no nails used in this at all. An advancing army would have been able to deal with the crossing of rivers. Leonardo designed several ways that armies could prefabricate a bridge and thereby be able to quickly construct a conduit for the army when the river posed a challenge. His design employed materials easily found and easily transported. So each stick is locked in with other kind of sticks. And this design was so powerful that somebody could walk on a small model and it not collapse. And then you take it apart, you move it, and do it again. This is called the parabolic swing bridge. And what you have the lighter end of the bridge sticking out over the water, by cranking it, the bridge moves out of the way so a boat can go, and you crank it the other way and it goes back into position. This is a model of the Golden Horn Bridge. It was designed in 1502 for the Sultan of Istanbul to cross the Golden Horn Inlet at Istanbul. Because the bridge would be 720 feet long, the Sultan was not convinced 
then it's a workable project, so it was never built. And it was considered beyond the tech, technology of the day. In a letter in which Renard described the project, it was discovered in 1952 in the archives of Constantinople. Believe it or not, there is a project now to construct a Leonardo a Golden Horn Bridge, one on each continent. And that's an example of a Leonardo design bridge. This is in Norway, it's called the Oslo Project and uh, built in 2001. It's a timber pedestrian bridge. A Norwegian artist is working to create at least one bridge on each continent. There were improvements in the original design to accommodate new technology, but that's the basic design of Leonardo da Vinci. That bridge, there it is. Leonardo's automaton designs. The idea of a mechanized human being predates the Renaissance times by millennium. Accounts of robotic beings appear in 10th century BCE text in China. Mythological reference appears in Greek, Jewish, and Norse legends. Even in the Iliad, there's a reference to a talk of mechanical handmaidens. And Aristotle in the politics, in the book Politics, speculated that automatons might assist in the abolition of slavery. So what was Leonardo's contribution to this dream? In the 1950s, a discovery in Leonardo's notebook dated around 1495 revealed a mechanized knight design. This automaton in armor was designed to sit up, wave its arms and move its head and jaws. It is not known if he ever attempted to build this robotic device. What is amazing is that when the device was built in modern times, it operated as designed. The internal systems consisted of a series of pulleys and cables. The design was partially the result of his anatomical studies in the mechanisms of the human being. So it was built in 2002. The model was able to walk and wave. And the designer of this model used it as an inspiration for robots he developed for NASA. Considered to be, the, this is a self-propelled propelled vehicle, considered to be the world's first self-propelled vehicle. It was designed to be a special attraction for festivals. A working model was built in 2004. It works like a wind-up toy. It can travel only 130 feet. Wind up the wheels to bring tension to the springs, which then provide the power. It had brakes and programmable steering, although it was capable of turning only to the right. It has been said that this machine looks very similar to the Mars Land Rover. And here's again how the transfer of power to the wheels. And this is an exploded view of that device. Considered that the most primitive self-propelled vehicles was made in the late 18th century, it was called the Cugnat. It is astounding that Leonardo was able to design a machine centuries earlier. His cart consumed no fossil fuel, nor burned any biomass at all. It was powered by kinetic energy created by cranking a bow-like set of arms, which when seeking to return to the resetting position, the resting position pulled the wheels with its gears. Now he attached, the, this was used for theater and here's the frame and over this frame would have been the shape of a lion. So this lion on theater would come on by itself, then it would stop, the lion would raise up and out of its belly would come flowers. But this is only, this is the, the framework of it. You don't see the, the picture of the lion. Anatomical studies. Leonardo said humans will never devise an invention more beautiful, more simple, and more direct than does nature, because in her inventions, nothing is lacking and nothing is superfluous. He also commented the human foot is a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. And here are some of his drawings. <clears throat> He uh, was able to dissect cadavers. He was allowed to do that. And, um, and he made these amazing 
of an anatomical drawings. The heart, the internal system, fetus. This is called the Vitruvian Man, based upon the work of a Roman architect, Vitruvius. It's also called the Canon of Proportions. What Leonardo did was design correlations of the ideal human proportions with geometry. Vitruvius described the human figure as being the principal source of proportion among all classical orders of architecture. This is considered one of the most iconic and famous of Leonardo's drawings. So here's a convergence of art, innovation, limited resources, and war. Leonardo divine new test casting techniques, science applied to art for the giant horse construction for the Duke of Milan. So he made this huge, this drawing of this huge horse, which was pretty cast. Um, it was tremendous. And what happens, he made a clay model a huge clay model, like you know, the, the size of the actual size of the uh, sculpture. But before he could get this thing cast in brass, um, the, the there was a war in which the French attacked the Milan, and all the the metal that he needed for this statue was converted to the creation of cannons and and, um, and artillery shells. So it never got constructed. But the clay model did exist when the French took over Milan at that time, they used Leonardo's horse for target practice. He never again mentioned the horse for the rest of his life. But recently, a horse was constructed using his designs. This is what it would have looked like if Leonardo completed the project. Look at the back leg, that little girl. There's one in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Allentown, Pennsylvania and South Lake, Texas. So what else? More for the mind of Leonardo. The use of solar power, a calculator, theory of plate tectonics, the study of hydro hydrodynamics, research in optics, including the human eye and a machine for grinding lenses, a study of botany, geology, mathematics, and astronomy, advanced work in cartography, experimental experimentation in chemistry, a design for an ideal cities and the principles of urban planning. He designed machines for the creation of standardized metal parts for machines, the grinding of the inside of a metal uh, cylinder, manufacture of bands of copper, the winding of thread into a, a, a bobbin for weaving, the improvement of the matchlock gun, utilization of convection and steam as a power sources, and he built a cannon using steam, not gunpowder. He was the first to discover the double curve of the human spine. And now you know why Leonardo never had time to play canasta. Leonardo the thinker, he said, it had long since come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. Men of lofty genius, when they're doing the least work are the most active. I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. Iron rust from disuse. Stagnant water loses its purity and in cold weather becomes frozen. Even so does inaction sap the vigor of the mind. So we must stretch ourselves to the very limits of human possibility. Anything less is a sin against both God and man. Just as courage imperils life, fear protects it. Now, when I first saw this one, it took me a while to figure out what he was talking about. Why does courage imperil life? 
because people with too much courage would go flying into a situation that's extremely dangerous. Fear causes us to run away from dangerous situations, so fear protects life. Although human nature commences with reason and ends in experience, it is necessary for us to do the opposite, that is to commence with experience and from this to proceed to investigate the reason. And that is the basis of the modern scientific method. And I thank you for your attention.